This is a piece of trinitite, a radioactive shard of glass formed from the fusing sand of the first atomic blast in history at the Trinity test site in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Among the few of its kind, it's a literal manifestation of the start of the atomic age. New science to master and discoveries to be made alongside new ways to wage war. But some among those warring nations knew those same rockets that carried such destructive payload could also be turned skyward, used to explore the new frontier of space, then and still full of deep mystery. But in that search for knowledge, that conquest of the stars, our newfound nuclear toys were yielded to that end with as much care as actual children. Destructively ambitious. The U.S. government conducted dozens of nuclear tests throughout our territories in the Pacific, but a fraction among them were conducted in space as well. Although lesser known than the explosive water detonations, these five tests, part of Operation Fishbowl, were no less dramatic, and yield some terrifying implications for the future of warfare, which we'll be covering in a minute. First, I need to tell you about the explosive history of weapons in space. But before even that, if you're hungry for keeping up with all the exciting developments in the new space economy, from where the money is flowing to the latest news, don't hesitate to subscribe to my free space industry newsletter, Launchpad, landing in your inbox once per week. Now back to business. Foremost among these many nuclear tests in space was Starfish Prime, the largest nuclear test ever conducted in space. On July 9th, 1962, an American Thor rocket carried the warhead into space and detonated. This isn't an aurora. This is the radioactive fireball of a nuclear explosion scattering over the Earth as it rotates below, like some hellish artificial replica of one of the most beautiful space phenomena. Without any air to slow it down, the blast of Starfish Prime spread far and wide across the vacuum of space, radiating heat and ionizing radiation so intense that it created artificial suns as far south as the equator. The generally accepted boundary of space is the Kármán line at 62 miles above sea level. At 250 miles high, Starfish Prime was sent well into the depths of space, so high and so large that it could be seen 900 miles away from Hawaii like a second sun. It released an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, that stretched for hundreds of miles in all directions. In Honolulu, it destroyed power lines, tripped burglar alarms, and shut down over 300 streetlights. And of course, it blanketed the region in radioactive fallout, of which many Pacific Islanders still suffer from today. All this dramatic testing as a counter-move to the Soviet Union, which had resumed its own nuclear testing after a three-year pause. Starfish Prime and the continued nuclear tension that followed it is a sobering reminder of technological dualism, how our tools can be used for both discovery and destruction, and how every frontier, no matter how remote, cannot escape the consequences of human nature. These nuclear tests opened a new paradigm, space as a battleground. And while no new nuclear tests in space have been conducted since the detonation of Starfish Prime, there are no shortage of creative options. And while it's easy to imagine that space-based warfare is a problem for future generations, perhaps when colonists on other planets rebel against Earth, or when genocidal aliens try to glass us into Trinitite, Yet yeah, these risks are not only real, but being put into place as we speak. Both Russia and China have developed missiles specifically designed to take out enemy satellites. Over the course of the conflict in Ukraine, Russia has made clear that Ukrainian usage of SpaceX Starlink terminals for battlefield communications makes them a target, and has even threatened to destroy the satellites themselves. The problem with destroying satellites is just how destructive it really is. Destroying one creates a massive field of high-velocity debris, and if that debris strikes another satellite, and another and another, it creates an exponential wave of destruction known as the Kessler Effect. I made a whole video on this topic, which I link to below for anyone interested. But the basic premise is that space junk creates more space junk until one day you look up at the sky like this. And there are thousands of more satellites being launched every year. As recently as 2021, Russia used one of these missiles to blow up one of its own old Soviet-era satellites, creating debris that the International Space Station itself had to manually dodge in its orbit. Keeping in mind that Russia is a member of the International Space Station, stations, satellites, all orbital infrastructure would and could be a target in a space-based conflict. And more targets are coming. SpaceX recently won a $70 million contract to build more Starlink constellations exclusively for the US military, under the name Starshield. 
Everyone laughed when the US Space Force was created, but it's clear that national security is now extending into international space. As recently as this past December, both the USA and China had a mini space race to launch two completely separate, yet highly secretive military space planes within the same week, both rumored to be capable of conducting surveillance and even dropping nuclear projectiles anywhere on Earth. And both these planes have been in operation since the early 2010s. They're nothing new. But even with today's technology, the wildly futuristic is possible, such as kinetic bombardment, also known as rods from God, where tungsten-coated poles are dropped on targets from orbit like artificial asteroid impacts. Fellow science YouTuber Veritasium made an excellent video on this exact subject, so go check him out if you want to see that concept in action. As of now, there aren't any known efforts to make real rods from God, though, with the closest attempt being a secretive US military research project from the 1980s called Brilliant Pebbles. While the project made considerable progress, infighting on the research team, along with technical hurdles limited by the technology of the time, prevented the program from ever seeing the light of day, ultimately leading to its cancellation in 1993. To give you an idea, the project called for over 1,600 separate large satellites to be able to strike anywhere on Earth, as only a single satellite would have been incredibly limited in reach and effect. And all this on the number of satellite launches per year numbered in the dozens. It grew too costly too quickly and was shelved for it. But rods from God might be the least of our worries, when we have equally destructive yet far cheaper means of weaponizing space. Earlier this year, the US intelligence community made concerning claims that Russia was developing an anti-satellite nuclear weapon, a nuclear charge placed into Earth orbit as a method of destroying enemy satellites or at least deterring enemy action. While it isn't known for sure, if it were true, then it would definitely violate the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which specifically calls for nuclear weapons to never be used off-world. Any nuclear device achieving criticality in Earth orbit would make the damage from Starfish Prime look like a firecracker. Thanks to the Kessler Effect, it would probably destroy the vast majority of satellites and kill every astronaut on orbit were it ever used, creating electromagnetic interference worldwide and casting deadly ionizing radiation down on whatever unfortunate country the detonation happens over. But all this is a wild hypothesis and is incredibly alleged to begin with. Hopefully it will never happen, though it is worth pointing out that not too long ago, the US and Japan proposed a United Nations resolution that would once again call for a ban on space nukes, but the resolution was vetoed by Russia. As a UN Security Council member, Russia reserves the right to make that veto on policies that it disagrees with but it does raise some eyebrows in their position of space weaponization. Either way, the fact that these discussions are reaching the highest levels of international government shows that the situation is not only credible, but worth taking seriously, and that space-based warfare may prove to be an inevitability, not just with the early age of satellite disruption that we're already seeing, but genuine in-space combat may prove a legitimate domain sooner than we think. All these wild technologies, both real and conceptual, are concerning, but will hopefully never be realized in an actual war. A better hope for this kind of technology and its use in space could be used for protecting Earth rather than waging war upon it. It may one day be necessary to stop an asteroid from striking Earth, as the NASA DART mission demonstrated to be feasible in 2022. Or maybe we really will one day have to face genocidal aliens. But the only way to find out for sure is to foster a collaborative diplomatic approach to space technology and weapons in space that allows us to see that glorious future the atomic age first promised us.